Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with David Roan of Dishonor Blades. I met David at his Blade Show table last month, but by the time I got there, he was nearly sold out. What attracted me to his knives and marketing were the beautiful, compact, ergonomic, aggressive designs. Now, he had two models, evocative of Japanese designs like the Kiridashi and the Quaken, to me. Uh, and the knives also seemed highly refined and built uh, in a confident way and presented in a way that made the company seem like it had been around a lot longer than it had. So we'll find out uh, about David and how he came to be a knife maker and what his plans are for Dishonor Blades. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share the show. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, that is the best way to help the show. And as always, if you want to uh, help uh, support us financially. You can do so by going to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. David Roan, welcome to the Knife Junkie podcast, sir. Great to have you. Hey, Bob. Good to, good to finally be here, man. Um, it's great to be on the uh, the Joe Rogan of uh, of night <laughs> podcasts. Oh my! Oh, please, that's that's man, that's a great compliment. Uh, I want to congratulate you on your <laughs> first um, your first and very successful Blade Show. Um, I had never heard or seen your work before, and when I came across it, you, know, you had some of the the smaller knives, uh, the Kiridashi style knives, and then you had a bunch of really beautiful marketing on the table. I couldn't believe I hadn't heard of you. Where'd you come from, David? That's, Bob, that's, that's the question, right? Um, it's kind of been this flurry. Um, so I don't know if I should go into the origin story just yet, but um, screw it, why not? So, so basically <laughs> two years ago, um, you know, we, we get into COVID. Everyone's kind of just clamoring to, to figure out who they are in this interesting time. And there was a moment where, um, like a lot of other people, we, we kind of, we vacationed to Austin. You know, we went to Texas, right? Like the, uh, one of the only, um, three places left to like go out in public. And so we're out there, we visit, and I was telling you earlier about my girlfriend, Sabelle, who's a glass blower and she's well known in her community. Anyway, we go out to visit a fellow glass blower of hers and we walk in their studio. Her boyfriend is standing there and he's got these beautiful knives laid out on the table. And I'm looking at him I'm, and then I'm looking at him. I'm like, these are kind of above average. Uh, what's going on? And then long story short, his name is Chris Adelhard and he is Pariah Knives. I'm not sure if you're oh, familiar with him. Yes, I am. Those yeah. are way above average. Yes, yes. Um, I think he got a, shot, a shout out from uh, Knife Talk a while ago, too. And they were talking about how his hand ground lines um, were were perfect and how he just holds his breath and, and just does it all control just from experience. And um, and so anyway, I'm witnessing these from a different like I backed into this unexpectedly and I'm just trying to figure out what I'm looking at. And, um, so I got to know him and hung out with him for a week. And then at the end of that time, I'm just like, dude, how do I get into this? Cause this is really cool. And I was like, what is it like a grand, two grand? And he's like, oh yeah, it's something around there. It's, it's not that bad. And, you know, little did I know that, um, that's almost like saying like, how much is it to be in college? Oh yes. Yeah, just the application fee right because like once you get into the the whole of knife making you know you're just like oh i should spend money on this and now this and and all of a sudden you're left you know in debt with no wife so um <laughs> yeah so it's been uh it's been a ride and i think i think i answered your question sorry if i went down this. well yeah no no that's ex oh. that was exactly my question because <clears throat> Just in the brief conversation you and I had at Blade Show and then looking at your website, you know, I, I, I know that you have 
a pretty varied past. And you studied architecture. You were part of the Los Angeles Police Department. Is that right? That I, I was actually a state trooper, uh, Florida state Highway trooper. Patrol. Florida Highway yeah. Patrol. I mean, okay, so those are those are two very um, very different fields <laughs> of of yeah. study and and engagement. Um, and I have to believe that both of those have fed a lot of inspiration into what you're currently doing, making knives. Uh, tell me first about the architecture and, um, yeah. and you know, what you did with that. Right. So um, I actually I was a state trooper first um, and it was this kind of. I don't want to say it's like this cowboys and Indians kind of thing, but that's sort of what it was, right? It's it's like a guy, a young man wants to um, feel like he can make an impact on the world, yada, yada. Um, but your question was about architecture. And so basically I, I hopped into that after um, a stint in law enforcement. And that was much more my speed where, um, you know, I grew up drawing a lot with my brother, um, I had that mindset, you know, my dad was an engineer and, um, so kind of combining the creativity and, um, and the, the logical side, um, that was kind of what I fell on. Um, and so I got a really quick degree in that. And then I immediately got hired out in Los Angeles, shipped out there. Um, and you know, that's the, that's kind of how the story goes. And so, um, sorry, and 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 I I went into um, uh, commercial office office design up first. So I was I was designing for like Google, for um, YouTube, places like that. Where you know you see like in the architecture awards, you see like the really cool hip tech offices and stuff like that. So yeah. I got to dabble in that, which was cool most of the time. But at the same time, you design something really cool up front, and then this giant tail end of just working on the drawings and coordinating with the, you know, the contractors and doing all the nitty gritty boring stuff. So. Yeah. That's, that's the stuff that keeps the building standing, right? <laughs> the, the nitty gritty. Boring <laughs> yes. stuff. Yeah. Exactly. As opposed to the, the fun of making it look uh, We have uh, good friends and neighbors and, and um, she's an architect who, who specializes in those kind of spaces too. Um, and so it's interesting to see kind of, um, how how they create and then how the client comes back um, at them. So so that you you said you grew up a lot doing <clears throat> drawings, doing a lot of drawing, and your father was an engineer. And you take those two things, put them together, you get an architect, you get a knife maker, you get uh, some sort of uh, creative person who's not a pure artist making things that are to only be appreciated on the wall, which uh, is is a completely different discipline as far as I'm concerned. Um, so. I can see how the architecture feeds into that. Tell me about the law enforcement. I didn't mean to uh, have you uh, uh, graze over it. I, I'm I'm very interested in finding that out. I, I did not serve uh, yeah. in law enforcement or in, in the military when I was a young man. And uh, when I talk to knife makers who have, it's a very direct line. And uh, it's, it's interesting to me. Tell me, sure. tell me about that. Well, yeah, you know, I, obviously most people haven't served in, in a, any capacity, but I think generally with men, we, we tend to always have that little itch like, Oh, I kind of wish I did this. I kind of wish I was in special forces, whatever it is. Right. Um, almost just to kind of check that box box and, and like, a, essentially like validate you. Um, and so, so really as a young man, that was, that was probably my primary reason kind of searching. Um, same, same for guys who joined the military. And, um, so I did that for, it wasn't too long. Um, it was about like five, six years. Uh, but I signed on and, um, you know, went through the Academy, did all this and that I wasn't the best trooper. And I say that because I was this guy who, you know, you're in a paramilitary organization, um, you know, they punish you with push-ups and stuff in the academy. All this, all these things where they didn't want outside the box thinkers. You know, they need guys right. who yep. kind of start to fit the mold and are good at just being like, this is how it is. This is how it's done. Let's go ahead and just do that. And anyone who raises their hand is like, you know what? I've got an idea. You know, it's just like, 
once you kind of get out of the way, um, which is a great segue into, you know, the even the name of the company, Dishonored Blades, um, which we can go into uh, in further detail. But um, but yeah, man, so so I liked to chase after people in a car or on foot. That was that was like that c- Cowboys and Indians thing that I that I referenced where I liked the glamorous part of it. Um, mm-hmm. And there's a lot of sitting in your car. There's a lot of writing a report, um, report after report, ticket after ticket, punishing people and kind of seeing like the, the bad side of them. Um, and, you know, you get jaded. Uh, so there are not too many people who come out of that field with like a really good, healthy perspective um, and, uh, and a nice demeanor uh, in public. And so, you know, that's, that's been kind of this learning process for me is kind of backtracking from that, like, you know, that tough, like that tough nature, like can't, can't have your back to people in an elevator kind of nature to, okay, you know, I can sit in this restaurant. I don't have to be facing, you know, from the corner out and watching everyone come in, you know, where, Oh, where's your hands, you know? Oh, okay. But yeah. So, so yeah, it's, it's been a really cool, um, discovering of myself, um, all the other aspects, right. Cause you just kind of, you become that to, to survive. Well, yeah, you state that, uh, and we talked about this a little bit that you've been a lifelong, um, knife junkie. I'll, I'll just, I'll say that you say knife head. <laughs> I like, I like that too. Um, what, uh, where did that come from? And, and how did you, I mean, I know me, if I, if I got a job, uh, with the sheriff's office or or the state troopers, I'd 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 be festooned with knives. I'd be you know, it would be the the big great excuse. Maybe I'll get to use them now. How how did knives yeah. play play into that? And where did your love initially come from? Yeah 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 yeah. So I I think in law enforcement you hope never to use a knife, right? Because that means you're in a very bad place. Knife fighting is not where you want to be. Um, that means you're up close with the other person. They can take it or they can cut you if they've got a knife too. Um, so for me, and I want to keep my eye on the other part of that question you asked, but for me, a knife meant a backup weapon and really a retention for my primary tool, right? Which was my handgun. And so I, I was trying to keep a, a TDI, a K bar TDI, uh, knife, which for those of you that don't know, you keep it on your support side and then you're, what you're doing is you're backing up basically your, your strong side um, firearm by <clears throat> if someone's grabbing my holster, I just cinch down on their hand. I don't try and get them off immediately. I cinch down on their hand so they can't let go. And then I just grab my knife and in one stroke, I rake across their hand. That's what will happen. And, and that's what quickly will deter them um, from holding on to your, to your holster. Right. And so, that was really all I had to train for. I didn't need to train necessarily past that because the goal is always to get back to your strength. Mm-hmm. Um, and to circle back to your other part of the question, I mentioned my older brother and and another thing that we did is we'd be on the floor and we'd have open, I want to say it was like early sharper image catalogs or something oh, but yeah. basically they'd have all the right it's like they'd have all this spy gear everything that like a little boy could want yeah. and we would flip through <laughs> and we'd play this game where it's like okay you you know point point to what you want first and you get to have that right and so we'd be like okay i got that i got that i'd find myself just always pointing to like the spider code knives or like you know the the gill hibbon knives at that time yeah. right and, yeah yeah um, right <laughs> and uh it's hilarious because like there was one christmas we're grown up and i'm with my brother and my my um brother-in-law and i had bought them all th- these throwing knives i was like all excited I was, like this is gonna be awesome we're gonna have like good man time after this they open the, <laughs> the, the pet presents up and they look at each other and they're just like what you expect us to like fly back with this and then i just knew at that point i was like me and my brother are no longer the same right um yeah. So I kind of stayed that little boy on the floor and he's, uh, you know, he's, he's done other things with his life, but, uh, yeah. That is funny, man. I, I 100% relate. My brother and I played a very similar game 
we had a uh, we have this book of weapons that uh, we both still have. Well, he has the original. I I bought a new version of it. But we would just flip the page. Okay, if you could have one on this page, what would you take? I'd take this one. Nice. Okay, what about this? What sword would you take here? And uh, yeah, so I play that game with my daughter too. When the uh, when the Smoky Mountain Knife Works catalog comes. Um, but that's interesting to say that, uh, you know, you you went your way, your brother went his way. Um, similar here, too. My brother has always maintained his his weirdness, along with being a, you know, a, a, a big wig uh, muckety muck. But um, uh, the thing that's interesting is that is that there is something gripping about it. And by it, I mean this love of knives and this, uh, you know, centering a lot of <clears throat> things around it. Um, and, and I, I, I ask everyone what it is and I don't quite know what it is and there's no wrong answer, but it's always amazing. Like why, why did David Rohn just like, why did knives captivate him to the point where he's made that his life, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's really true. What, ki what kind of stuff were you collecting once you became, once you weren't laying on the floor and you could actually afford stuff and buy stuff, yeah. what, were, what were you getting? And then tell me how that and your law enforcement started inspiring these designs you've been making. Yeah. You know, like, and I think part of the reason we pointed to catalogs for so long, right. Is cause like we weren't that rich and uh, you know, it's like the poor man's way of getting dopamine just being like, I get this one. It's like, <laughs> can you afford it? Not really. Um, but uh you know, at some point, I think, you know, a after college, when I could pay for some things, um, I was also restricted by uniform policy with uh, law enforcement, right? So, like, for instance, the K-Bar TDI, technically, that wasn't even a uniform policy. And because we were a state-run organization, they were a little bit more um, strict on that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, if, if uh, Superior spotted me with you know, wearing that knife, even though it protected me, they're like, yeah, that, you know, that's got to go. Um, so I was kind of, it's not like I could rock like a, uh, Lucas Burnley Obake or something on my, on my chest, you know, when I'm walking around. Right. So I was restricted in that regard. We were allowed to, to rock, um, out the front knives. Um, and so I had a microtech and microtech is, um, a company, just a brand identity that I respect a lot. It's kind of, I just resonate with their visuals, with their aesthetic um, and their style. So, um, so I got, I kind of got obsessed with like keeping track of them. Um, I really like Spyderco. The wave feature actually compared to out the front knives, obviously it's, it's more than twice as fast, right? So if you're talking about functionality, um, I actually, I think I replaced wearing my Microtech for a wave feature um, just because it was so much quicker to deploy um, and within policy. So. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, yeah, it's funny that you mentioned Microtech and it how it resonates with you because in my open, when I said that it seems like you've been around a lot, a lot longer, something about your marketing and your presentation not just on paper, but the the, uh, the the blades themselves. Now, what's the name of the little kiridashi? I'm calling it a kiridashi just loosely. It's a small utility blade that it's beautiful and it really focuses a lot of power towards that tip with that with that thumb swale there. Um, yeah, this yeah, this there it is. and so in your presentation reminded me of a company as refined as a Microtech, for instance. I appreciate that, and you know, obviously, that's what I'm going for. I'm not. Uh... You know, I'm not necessarily, I, I, okay. So I came to blade show and, you know, I didn't fully answer your question about, you know, where I came from and there's just so much to talk about, but I'm going to try to unpack this. Um, so I haven't been doing this for too long. I haven't been making for too long. Obviously every maker's goal, I think is to make a knife like the pros, right? Like if you love microtech, you're trying to be, you're trying to make something as good as Microtech. It usually doesn't work out. So I came to Blade Show as a first time um, seller, not with the goal of being seen as Microtech. Like that's, that's a fail, you know, that's, that's setting yourself up to failure. But 
I came just with the goal of getting feedback, of making friends, getting immersed in the community, right? And and I got so much more than that. Um, I did get a lot of really good validation on, you know, you're on the right track, um, that these things are, you know, a level up than, you know, what what a first time maker might might show up with. And that's really all I wanted was, was uh, to have something that was original called original, right? Like for mm -hmm. someone to be like, oh, I haven't really seen this knife before. Awesome. And I love it. Awesome. Um, and so I um, was very surprised how quickly I, I was starting to sell these things. Um, and to kind of go into details and obviously I'm rambling, so feel free to stop me. Yeah. But you did point out um, it's, it really all is designed to drive power through the thumb ramp. And I know Bob, you're super into Warren cliff blades as well. <laughs> when I first started getting into, um, when I started thinking about ergonomics, the Warren cliff just really made sense to me. Um, keeping track of like the Yojimbo, right. Um, I think we are very like-minded because we both, um, saw that first design and we're just like, yes. Um, and so this is almost, it, it, it's ridiculous to say, but it's like, this is my Yojimbo because it's the same grip. Um, it's a small knife, but I can get a full purchase basically. And it's hard to show you because, uh, yeah, essentially my pinky doesn't like, there's no, there's no weird spot for it. It actually curls around this, like, um, this return on the handle. Mm -hmm. And so it's like a full grip, even <clears throat> though it's, it's about as short a handle as you'd ever want for a full grip. Uh, and, and you kind of get like, <clears throat> I think the problem with a lot of these shorter knives that I've always felt is that you almost have this like Glock 19, um, dilemma where your pinky is like does it mm -hmm. do i want to fall off the edge or do i want to stay on right and that yeah. always pissed me off um and so this is kind of like um you know if you like the spider code dragonfly it's kind of like that um and there's I, i'd say there's four kind of like uh tension points on this handle it's like the finger choil the meat of your thumb and then your pinky and then the thumb ramp, right? So everything's driving like counter opposing forces into each other so that you get this just ridiculously good grip. Um, I put in Dave from Knife Center, Center's hands. Um, he said it felt super ergonomical too. And he's got these like big bear hands. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so, so yeah, man, um, this is, and, and, you know, feel free to ask me any questions, but this is, um, on purpose that I only have the finger group for the choil because mm -hmm. what I've noticed is that it gets less universal as you get more specific, like adding more and more finger grooves. And actually I have, speaking of the, like the Glock 19 dilemma, I actually have like, I'll show you, this is a, a gen three Glock and you can see the finger grooves here that mm -hmm. I just haven't deleted yet. Um, but they're made for like a, like a French barista or something, right? Like <laughs> if you don't have a specific, yeah. a specific uh, finger size, then you get all sorts of like un undercut bite and everything. And, yeah. and so, you know, the pinky dilemma, all of that <clears throat> makes me kind of steer away from getting things super specific just to my hands. I have the luxury of having a girlfriend with small hands and well, <laughs> Most girlfriends have small hands, but um, she's around all the time and she can grab a knife yep. that I've made yep. and just be like, yep, I like it or I don't. And so that's been another good filter for me. So I, I agree with you. A single finger choil is excellent. Two, you're you're on you're on dangerous, uh, dangerous thin ice, let me say. And then you 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 put the whole the whole thing in and then it's a mess. Uh, I don't have giant hands. Uh, I don't have tiny hands. So you know, where, where does that leave me? Uh, but what, what really, uh, you know, with this knife and please remind us of the name of the knife. I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. It's the chimera, the chimera. Okay. With the chimera, um, you know, I got a chance. You had two or three left. I think one had an ultim handle. 
um, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. But I had a chance to heft them and hold them. And it's really interesting. I've never heard anyone on this show use the specific terms, you know, um, and now I don't remember what you use, but countervailing forces and, and tension points on a handle to talk about ergonomics and grip. But yeah, there there you do feel that there's always a push pull, you know, in in in. Yeah in anything like that when you're gripping and you're and you're sort of pulling with the back of your hand pushing with the thumb and that handle is set up perfectly for it with the single choil so it's not alienating the other fingers and then that uh top curve um, and then of course the choil itself is thumb shaped and it has that back stop so you're not going to go or that front stop you're not going to go over the front um it's very right. very deliberate and you hold it and you and you know and to me, I'm always on the hunt, especially at Blade Show, where I can, at least the past three years, uh, where I can really hold on to things. I'm looking for EDC fixed blades because uh, though I love mm -hmm. my folders, um, fixed blades to me, uh, now that I have incorporated them into my carry um, over the past you know, bunch of years, including in the summertime, I'm always looking for knives that are like this, um, deliberate yep. and hand filling but still small and and nasty. You know, I I always, I always go for a little bit of menace. And this knife, you know, it has a little bit of menace to it as well. Um, but I'm I'm very interested. I see yeah. in the background behind you what what appears to me to be like a 3D printer. Is that a 3D printer behind you? So that's my CNC. I run a lot oh, of oh, stuff that's on that. CNC. Um, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, to get I was gonna into ask kind you about like, your prototyping, your designing and your yeah. building. How do you do it? Sorry, I interrupted. Yes. Um, <laughs> about to oh, no, 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 please. Yeah, I'm sure there's a delay. Um, but so essentially, when I first ran into Chris, uh, Pariah and I's, um, oh, and by the way, a fun fact is he still doesn't know that I've actually started knife making. Like, that's how You're recent kidding. all this is. Now, I'm dead serious. I like to surprise people with random stuff. Um, a quick little back or a quick little story is that I, uh, I, <laughs> the, the uh, U.S. Sumo Open is um, is pretty. It's in uh, what is it, Long Beach? Um, it's really close to where I live, and I signed up to watch it the first time, and then the second year around, I was like, "Can I sign up to be in this thing?" And so I did. They let me in, You're and so me. like I. I invited a bunch of friends, right? And um, I was like, yeah, let's go watch it. And then so so they're all up in the stands and they're like, where is he? Is he late again? You know, and then I, I walk onto stage and I'm wearing, you know, the diaper or whatever. And um, and so I'm competing in front of them. And so that I just like that. I guess the word is serendipity, right? Just like the unexpected. Um, yeah, I have a different word for it. That's a, <laughs> that's crazy. No, that's that's pretty amazing, man. <laughs> With no training yeah. to go in a, you know, my, my wife has a cousin similar to you, uh, who's, who's got, uh, uh, you know, he was in Thailand and he's like, well, I'm pretty physically fit. I've never done Thai boxing. He jumped in the ring. He beat some Israeli commando, you know, after nice. a bunch of beers. I, I, I really admire that kind of, uh, those kind of stones to get out there and sumo wrestler, I, I sumo wrestle. I'm assuming you never had, um, but same thing with knife making so you 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 meet chris from pariah knives he inspires you yeah. you start a company you go to blade show he still doesn't know yeah isn't that hilarious so like every couple months i'll just be like hey man i'll be in you know, i'll be in town like we gonna hang out and he's like oh shoot i've got like this he does kendo and so, so he's like i got this kendo contest and whatever we haven't met up yet and so every time i just want to like bring some knives and then be like hey guess what man I made this. We're we're doing this, right? And and it still hasn't happened. He almost came to Blade Show, but he had another thing. So yeah, next time I see that guy, like it's gonna be a really that's the stuff I live for, right? I just I want to uh surprise people. So tell me how you but, make these. Uh, yeah. They're they're I mean, it yeah, is yeah, a yeah. surprise how nice they are, uh, especially considering you haven't done it for long. Yeah, so when I first met Chris, I know we're kind of going all over the place, but he, yeah, he showed me how he does it. It's all just like beautiful hand work. Um, I love that. I, I was doing just manual for a while. The, what I quickly realized is I have so much design knowledge in my head. It's so much, um, well, just knowledge in general about knives. 
that my hand was what was holding me back. And so my personal style was to design things in 3D like I'm used to, right? Be able to like put it all on paper, see it, um, print it out, and then uh, and then start, you know, machining it that way. I use my CNC a lot. Um, you wouldn't be able to get like, imagine, you know, doing all of this by hand, like this yeah. groove and then this, like all these contours, it'd just be a nightmare to replicate at a cost that anyone would pay. Um, and, uh, so I start by, I start by hand sketching for a, a form that I like. I try and bring as quickly as I can into 3D printing um, because you can also print this out and tape it onto cardboard um, and cut it out and feel it that way. But you get to really feel all the 3D yeah, uh, the ergonomics width of, it. of it. And yeah. 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 And that, you know, the, re the 3D printer is kind of a recent addition and it's been just pivotal in the making of the Chimera. That was, that was my first like 3D um knife and uh so the the handles they have to be cnc even the where's this thing like even the contours on this guy it's like it's almost like there's a a chamfer on a chamfer right yep. and and like i just wouldn't be able to sell these knives um for a decent price uh without getting help from machines um hold that, the hold other that part a little of this closer. Is, uh -huh. hold that a oh, little yeah. closer to the camera so we can see that chamfer on the chamfer yeah right right there on the thumb ramp right you can see the main chamfer and then there's another right that would be a tremendous amount of handwork and it would be very hard to replicate that the same each time and i know that's not always the goal uh, but sometimes it is you know and and when you yeah. want every knife to look the same yeah yeah. And, and I think <clears throat> I also noticed that a lot of makers have the struggle of, of making a living. Right. Um, <laughs> I have, that. you know, I, <laughs> I have the good fortune of, you know, like making my money from elsewhere. And so if I'm ever going to fully replace that income, it's gotta be something scalable. Um, I've got to be able to pass this on to, you know, a manufacturer or whatever it is and, and not have to train someone how to machine this ridiculously complex knife. Um, so this was to me, the only way, um, you know, I'd love to also spend time in the shop, um, occasionally making like a pure custom knife. Uh, and I actually have something in the works with, um, with some glass artists that I want to kind of like, um, shine a light on them uh with some collabs so that that'll come later but um you know primarily yeah it's it scale is is always um i always have in in the back of my mind uh so when when i showed up at your table you were out of the 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 quaken style knife uh, that's what i'm calling it until you correct me uh that beautiful yeah. japanese you know um Weapony kind of looking Tonto looks yeah. like something you'd keep up your sleeve. A beautiful knife. Tell me about that and the design. It's it's you. It's 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 what you want. It's the same but different. It's very unique, but at the same yeah. time, it's a recognizable profile. Yeah. So, I'll I'll start with this one, which was this was my original. You know, like, if you can believe it, this was my first knife, basically. Wow. And. I designed it all around, you know, my logo, um, the Dishonor logo. And let's see if I can get a little closer. This is the last Cerakote one that I have um, on me. And it's slightly beat up, but you can see the detail with the laser. It's kind mm -hmm. of a bitch to laser properly and get all the detail in. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of like refining some stuff before I re-release this. But... This is, I think the technical name for it is uh, Osaraku Zukuri. And it's got a small following, just this blade shape alone. It's like a little more tapered. Um, and I know, who is it? Like Williams. James Williams, yeah. He makes one. His is beautiful. Um, 
trying to think who else, but, uh, but yeah, so this is, this is kind of like my ode to like the culmination of, of my experience with nice. Right. It's just like the visuals, the, the, the Asian influence. Um, it's kind of a balance between function and, and form. Like it really is. Um, I couldn't go too far um, down one path without like kind of reeling it back into the other. Um, but what I did was I'll show you this next one is <clears throat> I designed it around the logo and you see right here, like I had this oh. in mind from the get go was, was that the sheath was going to display this. Uh, That's wicked. The snake seal. Yeah. Through and, and so this is actually kind of my second rendition of this blade where it's blacked out. Um, I call this the abyss version. Um, this, this handles carbon fiber and it's uh, black oxide this time. But um, you can see basically like this seal right here. I'm trying to do this in reverse, but this seal right here is 3D and it's above yeah. all the rest of the flat, right? <laughs> so what we're talking about is machining and clearing all the metal around it just for this Jeez. stupid ass thing, right? Like, <laughs> like I actually came, I came to Blade Show being like, I hope everyone just points at this thing and is like, don't ever make this again. I hate it, right? Because then I was like, I then I don't have to make it anymore. Yeah. And you know, and and like it, you know, it's just a pain. It's such a pain to make. But unfortunately, it sold out like right away. Everyone kept stopping and looking at like the display one that wasn't even sharpened, um, and so that kind of sucked but also was like you know great validation because like okay yeah. cool we're doing something that people like um but does yeah you can imagine help? that uh-huh does that does that uh also help the sheath lock on that raised logo no it doesn't because i didn't want the sheath to rub and yeah okay pull off the coating right yeah. uh I actually tried someone someone asked me to try it recently so I tried a different version of the sheath and yeah no it wasn't working I would say the only solution would be for me to um preemptively kind of like sand down that area to make it have this worn look so it wouldn't right. um eat, right but let's see what else is there to this guy Well uh, tell me how you say, but... Tell me, maybe you'll you'll think of it as you as you uh, riddle me this. Tell me how how you make these in, like, what are your batch styles for this and or batch numbers for this and the Chimera? Uh, how do you how do you do your production? I know you're you're kind yeah. of ramping up, but yeah, that okay. So like Bob, this is happening like way too fast. Um, I I thought that I could kind of like reveal what I got get all this feedback, come back to the drawing board and be like, okay, this is, this is how we level up. Um, but fortunately and unfortunately it's, it's, it's like I've got in, you know, dealer requests and, um, and people are buying knives. So I've got to quickly get out of the R and D phase <clears throat> and refine my process to where I, it's like production process. It's no longer like fast pivot and flexibility pro uh, process. My, production at the moment if we're talking about like the hanzo it's like and and this is the hanzo um mm -hmm. i would say like i can make one a day um and that's that's really just with my time how much time i can allocate to making these um in like a reliable lead time that can easily ramp up um, I kind of have to figure out exactly how to scale, right? Like, when can you add an employee? How yeah. fast can you make things? Like, what if you add two machines? At some point, you know, it will scale really quick if you add more machines. But so there's wow. a couple processes that I can't necessarily speak to yet, but I'm I'm working through now. So we're catching you at a really exciting time, actually, just post yeah. post blade show because. Uh, you went there with with certain expectations and walked away with something much more, and now you're in that uh, you're you're on tenterhooks now, trying to figure out 
like this to me seems like the ultimate business riddle. Like how far do you extend yourself so that you can accommodate? Uh, but how far is too far? You don't want to overextend yourself yep. and then be left holding a whole bunch of really cool knives or, or, or however that works. Um, so, you know, this is this something that is going to require the addition of another person? And what would it take? How, would it be difficult for you to bring someone else in and have them making your knives? Right. Um, great question. I was actually listening to you talk to Shed Knives recently. Mm -hmm. um, and I was kind of thinking through that because you asked him a similar question and he has a different process. Like his, his are all um, done at like the, the, the bell grinder and by him. And so for him to pass it along to scale looks differently than me, right? Mm -hmm. um, that is kind of the problem I tried to solve by being um, primarily CNC based is that I'm passing along lower skill uh, responsibilities. Um, so a lot of it is, you know, loading a machine and um, taking the design I already had, you know, it's kind of like how Starbucks simplified their machines mm. to make a consistent coffee, right? It's like, they're no longer trying to teach a barista how to like perfectly steam the milk or anything. It's like, they've already done all the thinking and design into the machine part. And then they can, you know, they can hire a, a wider range of people to do the tasks. Right. Uh, required to scale. So, uh, for me, what it looks like is I would love to hire that person, right, to operate a machine. There's just so many things I'm finding out, like the social media game. I'm wow. not so good at that. I can I can take good pictures, um, but to put in the thought to write things out too, right? Like all those things it just requires so much energy up front. I think once you get the ball rolling, it's a little bit easier. Like my girlfriend, she can kind of crank posts out. She also has amazing work that's constantly original, but there's that game, the taking pictures game. And then my favorite part of the game, which is designing new styles, right? Um, mm -hmm. That's why I got into this. That's, that's how I kind of, um, that's how I get off is, is, making new creation and physically holding in my hand and, and then also um, getting people to hold it and then kind of validate what I already felt and backtracking to, you know, blade show, like that was, that was really the first time I got feedback except for, you know, friends, which, you know, friend opinions you can't count on. They're not necessarily good for much except for support. Right. Um, I got, I got a lot of, you know what the cool thing was, Bob, was that convention center. It was like two football fields, you know, worth of stuff, right? Yeah. And you would see the same faces over the weekend. You'd see a family walk by, walk by, walk by. Sharks. And yeah, and, and what was amazing was like the first day I never went into the big room. I didn't know how big it was. I'm just doing my thing next to the bow song kids. And, and, uh, there was a, I remember distinctly, there was this one family where this probably, I don't know, 17 year old kid, they walked by and they just kept eyeing my knives and, and just like admiring him. And I was like, Oh yeah, please like stay as long as you want. On the final day, he comes by and drops his hard-earned cash, which I'm sure was like his only purchase on one of the chimeras. <clears throat> and I hang on to that memory because I'm just like, what an honor, right? There's the guy who's got yeah. like 5000 in his, his pocket, right? And he's like, yeah, I'll take that. I'll take that. I'll take that. What about the one kid who only has one purchase and he spent it on my knife? And I was like, dude, I would have given you one for free. That's how much it means to me, yeah. right? And and he looked at everything all weekend. You know he did. And when I said everything. sharks, like that's what I feel like a blade show, a shark. Like can't stop except to purchase a knife. Otherwise I'll die. Just keep moving. Uh, there's something, <laughs> I, something yeah. I missed. Go back down that row. You know, uh, that is pretty That is pretty amazing. And also amazing for that uh, young guy to have a legit 
uh, handmade, beautifully considered and designed, you know, crafted knife. When I was his age, you know, I had what my grandfather had given me, which I still cherish, you know, but whatever I could kind of buy at the mall or whatever, you know, get from my brother, you know, but here's this guy who's, who's got this amazing thing and it, who knows, it could start a, a life for him, you know, making them or collecting them. Um, yeah, that's, mm -hmm. so what other kind of feedback did you get? Because I'm sure uh, people felt free to, to give it out. Yeah. And I actually, I would say like there were a couple starting with like the honest feedback for the most part, it was a hundred percent positive. And then I, there were a couple people I'm trying to think one wanted me to, to, to kind of radius this one edge. Um, Cause he was like, Oh, I might have like a hotspot here. So I was like, okay, perfect. That's awesome. Um, <clears throat> another talked to me about like a wiggle in the sheath for one of them, because I was just cranking out these cheese as fast mm -hmm. as I could for, for Blade Show. Um, and so those things, I, I hung on to those. I was like, okay, I got to keep this in mind because I had a suspicion, you know, quality wise, and they confirmed it. And those are the people that I'm like, okay, I'm going to remember who you are because I'm going to ask you again, mm. um, what do you think about this? Because you, I know you're going to tell me for real. Um, yeah. But so, so I would say as far as validation goes, people kept saying like, whoa, look at this. This is like, I haven't seen this before. Uh, my buddy, uh, tier one gear reviews, you've oh, actually, yeah, um, yeah I, I know you've talked to him and he kept coming by and talking to me about the Chimera and he was, um, he was super blown away. And, and that made me, there's my girlfriend in the center. That's <laughs> not me. Um, but, you know, he was, he was loving, like he was, as a designer, he was identifying all the things that I identified while making it and, and just kind of confirming that someone shared the same opinion. Um, and that was kind of what I got. I actually, not to plug um, too much, but I met uh, Lucas Burnley and TJ Schwartz <laughs> finally in person at Blade Show. And I'd been listening to their podcast for a really long time. Um, well, as long as it's been out, it's called uh, Edge and Flow, and they're amazing. But um, I've been listening to them as I was kind of coming into my own, hearing their thoughts on what to do and what not to do. I showed them my knives. Um, Lucas really liked the Chimera, and TJ really liked the Hanzo. And to hear him say like how much he digs the Hanzo and I'm actually giving one to each of them. Like they, they, they DM me and asked me and I was just like, dude, again, like, let me just give this to you for free. Cause like, that's, I got the reward. Like that's it. Um, but to hear kind of these industry heroes of mine say they like where it's going. That's, that's really all that mattered to me. I didn't like, I had this giant wad of cash when I came back from Blade Show, I didn't even count it or any like it didn't it just felt like paper to me, right? Because I'd gotten everything I wanted from the sh from being around the people and that mm -hmm. was it. Yeah, you can't ask for more than that. That's uh you know that that is that's just the kind of validation you would need to put wind in your cells and keep you going. Um for for anyone, certainly those two guys too. Uh, you know, I've never met Lucas Burnley, but uh, uh, T.J. Schwartz, uh, he's a very stand up guy, and his designs are just amazing. Yep. And then the fact that mm -hmm. he's now making them, you know, for the past couple of years, he got a CNC. I think he had to rebuild his garage around it or something like that. Yeah. And and he's producing. He's he's you know at least as far as I can tell from his Instagram feed, he's he's pumping them out, and uh, that's super admirable admirable um a couple of things i want to get to um is yeah, yeah. uh i want to find out uh what your what your design goals are for the future because like you said your favorite yeah. aspect is coming up with ideas and new designs um without without spoiling anything can you can you tell us what you're kind of looking forward to what kind of designs you want to make next yeah well i think this is a perfect time i i know you guys pulled up for a second my website um mm -hmm. But I literally just finished um, a new knife, basically, as the Chimera XL. 
Um, and my website kind of showed a hint of that while you're pulling it up. And this actually, so I had been asked to do it a couple of times, but you referenced him um, recently as name. What is it? This old sword. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And he, I, I saw him comment on one of my, uh, I think tier one gear reviews. He shared my, he shared the Chimera, and then he commented, kind of like, oh, you know, it might be a little small for me, which. I just I think if he held it in his hand, he'd feel very differently. But mm -hmm. I heard that and I was like, OK, I got you. And so I kind of just went back. And this. Oh, sweet. Is the XL, right? So here, I'll do a side by side. That's beautiful. OK, I got I got to say, David, this is a perfect example to me. I talk about this all the time. I'm sure you've heard uh, I lock on to certain topics and sometimes the longer yeah. blades are just a little bit more room for the the design to express itself. And seeing this, Dave and I uh, have similar tastes, uh, definitely, and we both like larger knives. Um, so I'm not surprised he he uh, mm. quipped that. But that to me is is uh, it's a it's a beautiful big brother to the to the other. And what's that handle scale? So this, I know it's there's like a bronze mesh. No, God, brass cool. mesh that's embedded. Yeah, it's really cool. It's slightly translucent too. So you can actually see and actually show you here is an Ultim. Mm, mm, mm. But now you can actually see the internal, right? So so I've hollowed out everything for weight. Um, so it's, it's balanced well. Uh, this one might be going to uh, Luke Spernley actually. But um, but yeah, so so the the skeletonized aspect like it just it takes light a little better and it'll kind of show there's like layers of of brass mesh in here and i did the brass screws too to go along with it but this is literally like fresh off the press bob like it's beautiful. i finished this last night wow and so we're wow. kind of we're going hard what's the what's the blade length on that so this one is three inches so this is like, this is kind of like, kind of kind of similar feel to like the Yojimbo, mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, it's weird because it's like it's significantly bigger, but it feels very similar to the regular size Chimera um, in ergonomics. Yeah, I think I think this, uh, I think giving people this choice between those two sizes is going to be even better. I mean, I think that this knife is going to take off anyway, but I think um, catering to, to those of us who like the larger, you know, just for whatever reason. Um, yeah. yeah. See, this is what I didn't get because like my wife says, I don't read things. Uh, but I, when I saw this on the website, I didn't, didn't note the XL and didn't really note the, yeah. the, the elongated proportions. But now that I have, I, I, yeah. Ah, it's beautiful. I, I I love this. Um, what other what other style knives are you interested in? Um, do you like uh, do you like knives of from all cultures, or are you do you have a, a mm. what's your what's your uh, taste? So I I'm Asian, and I have always kind of gravitated towards Asian style blades. Um, so that's kind of that'll stay in my wheelhouse probably forever um with that said like there's a bunch of blades that it's like you keep kind of showing different blades that aren't necessarily inherently uh asian that i'm like man i need to try that blade shape i'm kind of starting to get interested in like a cleaver um but there on my list is really i want to make an interesting take on a go to war blade and everyone's got this opinion on what a go-to-war blade means, right? Like some guys are like, I want a 10 foot long claymore, you know, that, right? It's like, they, I want to, uh, they think they're just like in the middle of a battle, battlefield Braveheart style. Right, um, right. And then, a, and then a lot of guys are like, I don't even carry a knife on me, right? Or it's just like a, a little M16, like a, a, a tiny little pocket knife. Um, I have my own opinions on what that knife might look like. Um, you know, kind of a mix of like a get off me knife, um, easily indexable. I want to say like 
I'd like to have a ring on it that you can index with your your pointer finger um, mm. that can fit into maybe Molly as well. Um, I know that that does exist at least in one or two forms, but I kind of want to make my own version. Um, that's my take on it. So that eventually will come down the line, but there are so many more um, parameters with a knife that you can say is a go to go to war knife, right? Like I'm not going to send anything to anyone that I know will break or fail in any capacity. Um, there are certain knives that like, for instance, it's, do they have a, a, some sort of retention point that that's more than just handle grip, right? Like if they have blood on their hands, if they're sweaty, mm -hmm. is there a guard or is there a ring? Like there's, there's not a lot of knives that exist that fit every bill. I don't think that a knife has to be necessarily that long um, for a soldier because you, you factor in weight and you factor in um, up closeness, right? Like if I've got a guy on me, I obviously don't want like a, like a foot long dagger yeah, that I'm pulling out and, and then I've got to, right. Yeah, exactly. It's like, I can only slash, I can't stab um, not to get too graphic, but it's like, I actually want the shorter, thicker, burlier blade that I can turn around and, yeah. and angle however I need to. So anyway, long story short, that, um, that will come down the, the pike as well as I have a double edged dagger that I'm oh. developing that I think you'll really love. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sorry. I have a, I, I may or may not have a folding knife in the works and I think, you know, overall my goal is actually just to keep cranking out new designs as, as much as I can while, um, holding production, um, at a, at a sat satisfactory level for people that want a knife. Um, the dealer thing is kind of like in question. I'm just, you know, I'm just like, okay, dealer and then direct consumer, all these things I'm, mm -hmm. I'm kind of playing with and, and figuring out how to work through it. I'm, I'm watching uh, someone, a friend of mine uh, who's recently started a custom uh, knife company um, and, and he's in a similar position. He got a dealer at blade show. And so now I see him, kind of doing that balance he's he's also new but also making exquisite things that people are really jumping on so he's he's scaling nice. up and you can see you know oh i just made these 10 knives to go off to the to the dealer i think that that's a uh it seems like an exciting opportunity uh when people get uh, it's, especially when it's understood that this dealer is not expecting five thousand units from you you know you're you're sending them what you're sending them and they're going and, and it's a feather in their cap too. Look at what we're offering. You know, we we have five of these chimeras here. Um, check it out. Uh, I, I I do want to get to this before we wrap. The name, uh, Dishonor Blades. Um, yeah. One one might have a a, a, a a pre existing idea about that. Tell us where it comes from. Yeah. So I I you know it's hard to get a beat on exactly how much controversy it has, but. You know, I did touch on it with um, the law enforcement, how I kind of would always go left when people want to go right. Um, and I would kind of label myself as a heretic in, in a lot of ways because I don't, I don't follow the crowd without thinking through things first. And I think when it comes down to brass tacks, like to make something memorable, you have to break the rules. Right. And so like, if I was just following the path of others, I'd probably have like a, a similar blade shape to everyone, a similar, similar handle. I would kind of um, make something that's bread and butter of the industry already. That's that I know is reliable. Um, and I'd be off to the races. I'd have 10 knives already. Um, but yeah so so there's that there's there's this takes the form in creativity um just like you know if breaking the rules is dishonorable then mm -hmm. that's fine i i choose dishonor right and then and then in the other aspect with law enforcement yeah it was like i can think of a, a lot of ways it takes form another way is that uh for example i chased this guy down the interstate for a while he was like an armed felon um I, I it, it was almost like what is that the men in black uh 
when Will Smith chases that one alien through the city and then corners him. And then, you know, that's how he gets hired for the, the men in black. That was kind of it. But, um, just picture a more Asian guy chasing this guy. Um, but I, the point I'm getting to is I chased him into this ditch in the woods. And I had this moment where I had to choose whether or not I was going to follow him down there because there was a safety risk. Like it's at night, it was probably 3 a.m. And I'm like, okay, should I or should I not? Well, I've come this far. So I jump down, I look left. I look right, don't see him, look left again, finally look right one more time. And then I realize he's been laying down in this drainage pipe, staring at me the entire time. Hmm. And the call out we got was that he was an armed felon. So he easily could have killed me. Um, he didn't. And I drew down on him and, you know, and we, we locked him up, but in that moment, I always think back to it. I'm like, okay, this was a life and death scenario. You could argue the honorable thing is to jump down there because it's your duty, right? But who's your duty to? Is it to the state? Like the public that doesn't really care if you die or not? I would argue that it's to your family to, to return home, right? Like live to see another day. This guy will mm -hmm. get caught. Let's do it that way, right? Um, so it it's dishonor is kind of like a question of what is honor and what is dishonor because a lot of times you can flip them and and so that's what the the name means that's interesting that's way uh more that's way deeper and and uh <laughs> and but also way more positive you know than than one could assume uh i i mm. in in meeting you you know i i knew that it was something more than you know you're not trying to be contrarian this is like disruption this is like um mm. you know not not following the rules to make the rules better to make things better and uh yeah it's much appreciated man thank you so much for coming on the knife junkie podcast it's been a pleasure talking uh with you about this and i'm going to ask you a few more questions uh in a different 10 minute or so long interview for patrons uh thanks one and Love all it. the patrons uh, but David Roan, I'm very excited about Dishonor Blades. I love what I've seen so far, and uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to see what comes next. I really appreciate you having me on, Bob. It's my pleasure. Take care, sir. Do you carry multiple knives, then overthink which one to use when an actual cutting chore pops up? You're a knife junkie of the first order. And that's exactly what I was talking about with David, having all those knives, but then there's one or two that you actually end up using. And I got to say that that Chimera looks like it could definitely be that knife. Thanks for joining me with this uh, with David Roan of Dishonor Blades. Uh, be sure to join me next week for another great uh, conversation with a knife luminary and also join us on Wednesday for the midweek supplemental. Thursday night, of course, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, live. Join us. Join the conversation. It's always a lot of fun on Thursday Night Knives. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.